So again, I'm Dr. Kirsten. I'm the Chief Education Officer here at Dental CE Academy. We're talking about uh, monkeypox this evening, what dental clinicians should know. The term was changed to MPOX by the World Health Organization and the CDC to reduce stigma and other issues associated with prior terminology. So for the better part of my presentation, uh, you'll see MPOX, you may see monkeypox scattered in and out of there, um, or MPVDX is the same. Agenda for this evening, this is a one hour presentation for one CE credit. Again, the first email is going to be sent to you to complete the quiz at 6.05 p.m. Be looking for that email. It's the same sender as the email you used to join in this evening. Be sure you check your spam and promotions folder and there's the link for you if you need to reach out. My conflict of interest and in financial disclosure, I am the Chief Education Officer here at Dental CE Academy. I have not received an honorarium. This presentation is not sponsored this evening. We have a lot of material to go over. Again, if you have any questions, be sure to type them in the chat area. So my background, I'm a public health dentist here in Maricopa County, which is Phoenix, Arizona. It's the fourth largest county in the US and I was the chief for the Office of Oral Health here for Maricopa County's health department, which happens to be the third largest health department in the US. Um, and I've been providing continuing education since 2006, I'm a former assistant clinical professor as well. And I've retired from clinical practice after nearly 38 years, uh, just a couple of years ago. All right, learning objectives are in your handout, so I won't go through those line by line with you. You can refer to those. We're gonna talk about some background here about MPOX and the first outbreak. So monkeypox, as it was termed then, was first discovered in 1958, and it was an outbreak that occurred in monkeys in a Denmark lab. The human monkeypox, however, was first identified in humans in 1970 in the um, Democratic Republic of the Congo. And it was in a nine month old infant boy, and it was in a region where smallpox had been eliminated in 1968. Now, we'll see smallpox is part of the orthopox family of viruses as well as monkeypox. So since that time, most of the cases of monkeypox have been reported in rural or rainforest regions of the Congo Basin, especially the DRC. And the human cases have increasingly been reported across Central and West Africa. Now, in early August of this past year, the U.S. declared the ongoing monkeypox outbreak as a public health emergency. Two weeks prior to that, the World Health Organization declared monkeypox a public health emergency of an international concern, and that is a designation reserved um, to describe, in the past, polio and COVID-19. So until that outbreak in August, nearly all cases in humans outside of Africa were linked to imported animals or travel to other countries from locations where, uh, where monkeypox was endemic. Now we're gonna look at a timeline here. The current outbreak, first recorded case was May and that outbreak was in Massachusetts. And as of today, I looked up the current data 193 um, cases in the U.S. plus 32,000. Now, 30,193 cases in the U.S. And when you compare that to September, when I first started presenting this course, we were at 19,962 recorded cases and 20 deaths. Very early on, zero deaths. Now we are at about 32. We're going to look at the global numbers. As of September, at that time, it was about 53,000. I believe it's sitting around 89,000 globally. Let's look at demographics. 
So as of February 15th, and this was the latest update from the CDC, total U.S. cases 30,193, again, total deaths 32. And if you look at the math legend, and we have the link for you, so you can go into the link at any time as long as they have it posted. And you can see that the Southwest right now has the greatest number along with Texas, Florida, uh, some of the Eastern states, New York, Pennsylvania. And those with the least, it looks like maybe the Midwest. This is the global map. So remember, we saw about 59,000 or so in um, September of last year. We're at 85,922. And 84,000 and some change are from areas where monkeypox had not been previously reported. This is the trending cases for monkeypox. And you can see that it has trended quite drastically downward, which is a great thing. This is how viruses are supposed to behave when we launch a battle. SARS-CoV-2 didn't provide us with this sort of outcome, really. So this is really testimony to be able to um, get testing out there, vaccines, education. And this virus, of course, is just not behaving like um, SARS-CoV-2 is in all of its variants and subvariants. So current by current uh, MPOX cases reported to the CDC age and gender wise, and you can see, and again, the link is there for you. This is still primarily an infection of men. We do see some women, some trans, transgender men, some transgender women and um, others. And if you notice the age group 31 to 35, trends upwards and then downward from there. These were the cases reported to the CDC by race and ethnicity. And what's significant for you all to realize is that early on, just like SARS-CoV-2, Caucasians seem to have better access to testing and what vaccines were available and pre-exposure and post-exposure uh, prophylaxis. But as we see, as we trend over time, that changed and we were, we're now reaching out, probably not as well as we could be, but um, to other race and ethnicities. So there's more of a distribution. But early on May of 2022, you can see that probably about 70% or so Caucasian cases were identified and then um, Black. But as we move along here, we can see the trend where we are um, accessing or those of other races and ethnicities are accessing the care. Now, these were the monkeypox cases reported to the CDC, the signs and symptoms of, as of November 3rd. This really hasn't changed much, and we're going to go in much more in detail, but rash, fever, malaise, chills, pruritus, rash, uh, itching rash, lymphadenopathy, headache, myalgia, rectal pain, rectal bleeding, tenesmus, pus or blood in the stool, vomiting, nausea, proctitis, abdominal pain and conjunctivitis. Let's take a look at epidemiology. And again, if you all have just logged in, be sure to take a look at the instructions that I have in the chat area. And be sure to also download the handout and CE credit instructions. They may be sitting in your email. It was sent 30 minutes ago, but you can tap on the banner at the top of the screen. You need this to be able to receive CE credit this evening and pass the quiz. So make sure you do have access to that. If that banner does not work on your device, please use the link that you'll find in the instructions, which is the orange box in the chat area. 
Okay, epidemiology as we move forward here. So since 1970, we know human cases of monkeypox have been reported across 11 African countries and we have them listed here. In 96 to 97, there was an outbreak reported in the Dem Democratic Republic of the Congo with a lower case fatality ratio, but a higher attack rate than usual. And there became a concurrent outbreak of chickenpox, which is varicella virus. It's not an orthopox virus, as we'll be talking about this evening. So they are not in the same family. Um, this concurrent outbreak of chickenpox and monkeypox was found, which may have explained these changes in transmissibility in this particular outbreak. Since 2017, Nigeria has experienced a large outbreak with over 500 suspected cases, over 200 confirmed cases, and a case fatality ratio of about 3%. And those cases continue to be reported until today. The first monkeypox outbreak outside of Africa, though, was in 2003, and it was in the United States. And it was linked to contact with infected pet prairie dogs. So as pets, they were imported to, into the US and they were housed with Gambian pouched rats and dormice that were imported into the US from Ghana. Now, this outbreak led to over 70 cases of monkeypox here in the US. Further cases were attributed to travel outside of Africa, including travelers from Nigeria to Israel in September of 2018, Nigeria to the UK in September of 2018 and other months on up to May of 2022, Nigeria to Singapore in 2019, Nigeria to the United States in July, November of 2021, and then in May of this past year, as we said, multiple cases of monkeypox were first identified in several non-endemic countries, meaning had not been present prior to that time. So this outbreak that we're talking about that originated here in 2022, about May, is different than the other cases that we identified earlier. In 2018 to 2021, as we said, there were a total of travel, 12 travel associated monkeypox cases reported outside of Africa. But this past year in 2022, for the very first time, many outbreaks were reported in the European Union member states and worldwide in non-endemic countries that had no epidemiological links to travel or imported mammals. That means it is community spread. Let's look at characteristics of monkeypox. So monkeypox virus characteristics. Monkeypox is a zoonotic disease, meaning it originates in animals. And it is usually animal to animal transmission and oftentimes in zoonotic diseases, humans become an incidental host, all right? That virus jumps ship and instead of infecting an animal, it infects a human. And of course, we've seen multiple cases of that, including SARS-CoV-2, probably bats um, and so forth. So outbreaks are initiated then by human contact with infected animals in this case the outbreak that we spoke of earlier, pet prairie dogs. The primary reservoir of the virus is unknown, but it's likely that one or more species of rodent is the uh, reservoir. Humans and non-human primates, thought to be, again, the incidental or intermediate host, they are not normally reservoir hosts of monkeypox. And it's not known if rodent species native to the U.S. could serve as a reservoir host. We have prairie dogs here in the Southwest, right? Symptoms seem to be similar to, but less severe than smallpox, which was eradicated in 1979 due to widespread vaccination. 
Now let's talk about the monkeypox virus um, belongs to the genus of orthopox viruses. Orthopox viruses are very large viruses with DNA genomes, and this genus includes variola virus, which causes the human disease known as smallpox, and it also includes vaccinia virus, and vaccinia virus was used in its attenuated form as the smallpox vaccine. Also, the horsepox virus, cowpox virus, and others, 13 total. And there's the list for you. So you can see, again, variola, so infections in human. That is smallpox. Vaccinia, that was the virus that was used in its attenuated form to inject myself included. So I'm giving away my age um, to prevent smallpox infection or reduce its severity. Buffalo pox, rabbit pox, monkey pox, cow pox, camel pox, raccoon pox, um, and so forth. So let's talk about the smallpox virus because it is in the family of orthopox viruses. It, there are some similarities and there's some concerns that maybe when we eradicated the smallpox virus, it created a niche for the monkeypox virus to proliferate. So again, it is the variola virus. It was a century's worldwide human threat. The mortality was 30 to 40%, depending on the region that you hailed from. And its successful eradication was due to widespread vaccination and quarantine by the World Health Organization. Um, and it was completely eradicated by 1980. The last natural smallpox infection occurred in Somalia in 1977. 1979, it was eradicated, uh, declared eradicated by the World Health Organization. And the smallpox vaccine, which is vaccinia, is the first to ever be developed against a contagious disease. So for those of you who are as old as me or older, you have this scar on your left arm, don't you? It's the smallpox vaccine scar. Um, most of us were lined up or taken to our doctors and this was a big deal. It was almost like a rite of passage. You couldn't swim, you couldn't touch it. If you touched it, this was live virus in the scab that was healing. If you touched it and rubbed it in your eye, you could cause your eye to develop smallpox lesions. So it was a big deal. Now this photo on the right are two boys that are 13 years of age. And the one on the right was vaccinated during infancy for smallpox. And the other on the left was not vaccinated. Both were infected from the same source on the same day. Now note that the one on the left is what is called a fully pustular stage. The one on the right has just a couple of spots and they're already scabbed over. So his healing on the right was much quicker. The severity of disease was lessened by the vaccine. It did not prevent his infection. It kept him out of the hospital or the morgue, which is what vaccines are intended to do. I often think if, um, SARS-CoV-2 caused this sort of pustular rash on the face um, and other areas of the body, there probably would have been more vanity involved in getting a vaccine um, because it is pretty horrific looking. Monkeypox vac vaccine and genomics. So, or not monkeypox virus, excuse me, and genomics. So the monkeypox virus is an enveloped DNA virus. And it has a genome that is 10 times larger than that of SARS-CoV-2. But like the other orthopox viruses, it evolves very slowly. So you don't get the mutations that you do with SARS-CoV-2 and Delta and Omicron and all of that. Um, its genome changes 100 to 1,000 times slower than that of SARS-CoV-2, which again, 
harkens back to the reason why we don't have the number of mutations as quickly as we do with SARS-CoV-2. So again, it's an envelope DNA virus. It is very large. You'll see it in comparison here. And it does not proliferate, does not uh, reproduce as quickly as SARS-CoV-2. So look at the size of this next to HIV, SARS-CoV-2, and then the polio virus, which looks like it's just uh, minute compared to the large envelope virus of the monkeypox virus. That might be a quiz question, so hopefully you're, you're listening up here. So um, Wendy wants to know, would the case on the left be fatal? Um, well, there was a 30 to 40% fatality rate at that time, Wendy, for smallpox. Yes. And we have someone from Brazil who did have the smallpox vaccine. She's 24. So it depends on the country that you're from. All right, current outbreak now. So understand that this current outbreak is quite different than the previous outbreaks, the symptomology and so forth. The present outbreak is a subgroup of monkeypox viruses, which are called clades. And these are associated with less severe disease than other groups. So historically, this clade was not associated with significant human to human transmission. It was zoonotic, right? It went from animal to animal. Now, the current outbreak is human to human again, and its transmission is currently seen primarily in men having sex with men, but we'll see that also other populations now have, um, tr have transmitted. Populations at risk. So since the early outbreak, here's what we know. Most monkeypox virus infections during the current outbreak have been transmitted through close skin-to-skin -skin intimate contact with symptomatic people, primarily during sexual contact. And the majority of infections have been transmitted among men during male-to-male -male sexual contact. However, since May of 2022, there has now been heterosexual sexual transmission, transmission to children through close, non-sexual skin-to-skin contact with a caregiver, transmission through needle stick with a skin lesion that uh, contaminated sharp, also through body piercing and tattooing. Patients are becoming inoculated with monkeypox as a result. Occupational exposures in absence of full or sufficiently effective personal protective equipment have also been reported. So we have two groups of monkeypox, at least, known as clades, originating out of the Congo Basin and West Africa. Now, again, the clade is a group of viruses from the same species that have similar genetic sequences, but distinct genetic clusters. In the Congo Basin clade, Central Africa, about 10% of those cases are fatal, known as the clade one. The West African clade includes the virus that's responsible for the current outbreak, it's associated with a lower death rate, about 1%. Previous outbreaks were less transmissible than the Congo Basin clade viruses. So these are known as clade uh, 2 or 3 or clade 2B is what the current outbreak is called. Any questions or comments before we go to clinical presentation? So clinical presentation is why we're here here today as well, because some of us may have come into contact with monkeypox patients because of its presentation. The classic clinical presentation prior to this current outbreak, fever, fatigue, headache, backache, mild to severe pulmonary lesions. So those lesions actually develop in the lungs, anorexia, dyspnea, 
nasal discharge, lymph adenopathy, chills and or sweats, sore throat, pharyngitis, cough, shortness of breath, rash, conjunctivitis. And note that lymphadenitis or lymphadenopathy is a feature of monkeypox disease not seen in smallpox. The classic clinical presentation incubation period, five to 13 days on average, the range is four to 17. Prodromal phase, so the fever, malaise, headache, weakness, lymphadenopathy can be generalized or localized to several areas, maybe the neck and the axilla. The rash appears shortly after the prodromal starts. That is the classic clinical presentation. We're gonna talk about the current outbreak, which is quite different. Typically, these lesions develop simultaneously. They evolve together on any given part of the body. There are four stages, macular, which is the flat uh, lesion, papular, now it's raised, vesicular, meaning it's um, fluid filled, pustular, almost pustule, think of pus, before it scabs over and resolves. These are well circumscribed lesions. They are deep seated, meaning they go deep into the dermis so they can cause scarring and they're painful, but also with umbilication. Umbilication is the depressed center or fossa, almost giving it a donut like appearance. When disseminated, it tends to be centrifugal. So it affects the arms, legs, hands, and feet. It can involve the palms and the soles as well. And the illness duration is typically two to four weeks. So that is the classic clinical presentation. Then we're going to look at um, the current outbreak. So here's what the classic rash often looks like. And you can see on the upper left corner of those photos, photo A, the umbilication of those lesions, right? The center, which is depressed. See the pustule stage there in C, the vesicular stage there in B. Let's talk about the current clinical presentation. Now, instead of being generalized, this is scattered or localized to a body site rather than diffuse. The rash will often start in the mucosal areas, the so oral mucosa, genital and perianal areas, and may not develop simultaneously in all body areas. Features, symptomology, proctitis, anorectal pain, tenesmus, rectal bleeding, associated with visible perianal vesicular, pustular or ulcerative skin lesions, oral pharyngitis, sore throat complicated by tonsillar swelling, abscess, dysphagia, and the prodromal symptoms that we saw in the classic presentation may be absent in the current outbreak or may actually follow the onset of the rash. So they may present with a rash first and then develop the symptomology of what we would call the prodromal phase. And we're gonna look at some photos here in just a minute. So this current outbreak presentation is different. Lesions on the genitalia, the perianal region are more common because of its sexual transmission, skin to skin contact. Some patients with current outbreak may not present with fever. The pitted scars and or areas of lighter or darker skin may remain after the scabs fall off. Once all the scabs are fallen off and there's a fresh layer of skin formed, the person is considered no longer contagious but those scabs that fall off are highly contagious. They are full of virus. So that's why infection control and everything else we have in place is so important. Regarding the current outbreak, the oropharynx and saliva, high prevalence of oropharyngeal and perioral lesions at diagnosis, also evidence indicates that exposure to the oropharynx and saliva can transmit infection. However, insufficient data exists to determine if an oral lesion needs to be present at the time of that exposure. Oropharyngeal mucosa can exhibit lesions 
that are typical of monkeypox virus infection. Multiple studies have indicated that monkeypox virus DNA is detected by PCR in the nasopharyngeal and oropharyngeal swabs. This is a photo of someone with the current outbreak. And you can see that it is isolated to regions. It's not diffuse. So the feet, the arms in this case, the hands, the soles of the hands, and the face. And perioral. But oftentimes the initial presentation may be the oral mucosa. And so this is something that you may see in your soft tissue evaluation of your patient during an exam, for instance. So we can see uh, the photo on the very left, the soft palate and the tonsillar pillar. You see the tip of the tongue on both those remaining photos looks very painful. Here are a few more photos of the oral and perioral lesion presentation. So A is a very clear example of what those vesicular lesions or umbilicated lesions look like. Notice the center, that depressed area or um, fossa area, if you will. So it's almost the shape of like a um, Cheerio. Also, we see perioral vesicular lesion. This is on day eight in photo B. Patient was PCR positive. In photo C, also on the left corner of the mouth on day seven. So PCR positive. On photo D, an ulceration on the tongue. Photo E, tongue lesion on day five of the infection, PCR positive. F, G and H, pharyngeal lesions. Look at those. How do we detect monkeypox? Well, of course, asking our patients if they have any mouth sores. I think if they have mouth sores like that, they're going to also let you know too. It'd probably be very painful. Of course, evaluating them for rashes and lesions on the tongue, oral pharyngeal area, corners of the mouth, contact their local health department. If they suspect a monkeypox lesion, they will need to be tested. Now this current outbreak, because its presentation is so different, it can lead to a misdiagnosis as a sexual transmitted infection or varicella, chickenpox, syphilis, chancroid herpes, it may be confused again with molluscum contagiosum. What's the difference? If you have never seen a case of molluscum contagiosum, I can tell you because I trained during the AIDS epidemic in San Francisco and many of our patients had molluscum contagiosum because it was an opportunistic infection at that point. And they're hard. So if you palpated molluscum contagiosum, you're going to feel hard bumps. They're not going to be vesicular and fluid-like. Swollen lymph nodes, lymphadenitis are a feature of monkeypox disease not seen in smallpox. Again, Wendy has a um, comment here. I can't even imagine with the oral lesions, they would even come to see us rather than their MD seems less likely for us to see question mark. Well, when you think about the patients that come to see you with herpetic lesions, right? They'll come in maybe at the early stage of a herpetic lesion or one that's in full-blown vesicular or one that is um, now starting to crust over. Or they may come in with a really horrible looking case of angular chylitis. So they may not know what it is, which is just, you know, keeping in the back of our mind potentially what that differential diagnosis could be. And, and not just for monkeypox. You know, sexually transmitted infection and so forth, which of course is, can be herpes. Transmissibility. But you're right. I mean, if you had, if you woke up with oropharyngitis and you looked in the mirror and you thought you had a strep throat, 
you're not going to go to your dentist. You're right. You're going to go to your primary care doctor. But we've had patients that have come to see us with conditions that were scratching our heads saying, why in the world would they keep this appointment and come in and affect all of us, right? So, but you bring up a good point. All right, is monkeypox a sexually transmitted disease? It should be accurately described as sexually transmissible because sex is one of the ways that monkeypox can be spread. Now, in the past, we know that outbreaks were linked to what, direct exposure with infected animals, animal products, food, limited person to person spread. In this current outbreak, the virus is spread primarily through close personal skin to skin contact. And that is what makes it very different from the other outbreaks. So it may include contact with infectious lesions, respiratory secretions via close sustained skin to skin contact that may occur during sex. And however, any close sustained skin to skin contact with someone who has monkeypox can spread the virus. So the infectious dose of monkeypox virus in humans is unknown. Based upon studies, mostly the Congo Basin clade in non-human primates, the infectious dose via inhalation is estimated to be between 10 and 10,000 infectious viral particles. Put that in perspective, Ebola can be one, all right? Now, West African monkeypox viruses have generally been found to be less infectious than the Congo Basin clay. So monkeypox transmissibility and are not um, you may have heard are not early on in the pandemic. New research suggests that the current outbreak strain may have accumulated mutations that increase its transmissibility. And that makes sense because that's what viruses do. Viruses are on the earth to survive and replicate and use you as a host. And they proliferate very quickly, which means Mutations can occur very quickly, and we're experiencing that with SARS-CoV-2 and all of the variants and subvariants. But this virus behaved itself more or less. Um, we were able to take a look and sort of look at prior outbreaks and make determinations that actually panned out. And those that were at risk became vaccinated because they didn't want to be covered with lesions and become ill. Now, there's not yet enough evidence to, to suggest that these mutations dramatically increase the R0 of the virus. The basic reproductive number of monkeypox, the R0, is estimated to be between 0.57 to a maximum of 1.25. Again, we don't have the current outbreak established yet for R0. Now, when you compare that to SARS-CoV-2, the R0 of the BA5 variant or subvariant is 18.6, six times that of the original strain of the SARS CoV 2 virus that emerged in 2019, estimated to have an R0 of 3 to 3.3. All right, so the infectivity and the transmissibility of this of the BA5, and we're not even talking about the current subvariant, is 18.6 times that of the original virus. So again, R0, that is an estimate of the number of secondary cases that are generated by one infected or infectious individual when the rest of the population is susceptible. So for example, at the start of a novel outbreak, and that was an R0 um, transmissibility was used quite often early on in the pandemic. We don't really hear about it now, even though the current variant is much more transmissible than the original SARS-CoV-2.
And again, that might be a quiz question, just in case the current monkeypox virus, much lower or not. All right, this animals to human transmission, animal to human, as we know, zoonotic transmission can occur from direct contact with the blood, body fluids, or cutaneous or mucosal lesions of infected animals. And in Africa, evidence of monkeypox virus infection was found in many animals that included rope squirrels, tree squirrels, Gambian pouched rats, dormice, different species of monkeys and others. The natural reservoir of monkeypox has not yet been identified, though rodents are the most likely. Eating inadequately cooked meat and other animal products of infected animals may be a possible risk factor. People living in or near forested areas, and again, this is in Africa, may have indirect or low-level exposure to infected animals, unless this virus jumps ship again and infects the um, prairie dogs here and, and similar you know, rodents, then we may have a problem. Transmission human to human respiratory droplets. So healthcare workers in close proximity have an increased risk. Direct contact with body fluids, lesion fluid, Fomites, these are your inanimate objects like bedding, towels, dental chairs, surfaces like counters, anything that could be contaminated with lesion material, non-intact skin, non-respiratory mucous membranes, placenta transmission, so mother to infant. Based on the available evidence, the rates of droplet transmission in this outbreak do not appear to be different from prior outbreaks. The question, as we said earlier, is monkeypox filling the niche left by smallpox? And the evidence suggests that the transmission rate of monkeypox has increased over time due to declining immunity in the population after smallpox was eradicated at the end of the uh, vaccination in the general public in the US. So many of you are not vaccinated for smallpox because you're not as old as me. But those of us who are, we are probably not immune anymore because that vaccine wears off after, I think, what did they say? Your, your um, protection, the, your ability to mount an antibody um, attack, if you will. Everything wanes after about five years with the vaccine. But by that time, smallpox, back when I was vaccinated, was eradicated. Okay, testing, treatment, and vaccine options. Testing was a challenge early on. Local testing was slow to ramp up. Labs have now increased capacity. Results do take time. Testing detects virus in active lesions that may not appear until one to two weeks after the incubation period. So these are all challenges. There are probably more cases than the current data. Community spread may not be accurately known and it's suspected to be greater. I think there's more of a handle on that now. Clinical diagnosis. There is no fully US FDA approved monkeypox vaccine or virus specific uh, vaccines that exist. The US CDC developed an FDA cleared test for provisional use, all right? So currently 67 laboratories across 48 states, five commercial laboratory companies received authorization to use the CDC test. And within the US, culture-based diagnostics should only be performed by the CDC per their guidelines. Now, PCR-based detection is recommended by the CDC, but you have to have optimal samples of scab and lesion material. So there's been, you know, issues with the operator error here. So that is say that testing um, has ramped up quite a bit since May of last year. Tests based on detection of antibodies, so to see if you were infected in the past can be performed, but they have limited utility in the early phase of the disease. 
And the current CDC case definition requires that a patient be PCR sequencing or culture positive to be uh, considered a confirmed case. So antiviral treatments. These are two that were approved by the US FDA for treatment of smallpox virus under the animal rule, tecoviramat and brincindivir. In a published case study, tecoviramat was found to reduce hospitalization time by more than half in a treated patient with monkeypox. Now, brincidivir, cidofovir here is effective against other pox viruses including vaccinia and smallpox in vitro and animal studies. Also, we have vaccinia immune, immune, globul, in, immune globulin now. Why is that a potential treatment option and why is it not used in some populations? Because if you have someone who is uh, immunocompromised, it probably is not prudent to inject them with immunoglobulin, right? So sidopavir, tecoviramat, vaccinia, immunoglobulin can be administered intravenously. These are treatment options. Can also be used as a post-exposure prophylaxis and the smallpox vaccination should be administered within three days of exposure for maximal effect, but it may still attenuate disease if administered as late as two weeks post-exposure. Now, vaccination with the smallpox vaccinia virus is reported to provide protection against 85% of monkeypox infections, but that is a recent smallpox vaccine. That's not a smallpox vaccine that was given in the 60s and 70s. There are two that are licensed by the FDA for use in the U.S. Emergent is one, Genios is another one, and I won't go into much detail on that, but um, that is what has been distributed with some great success here. Infection control. Follow the EPA guidelines. And there's a link there for you. Monkeypox applying what we know about biological agents to prepare for emerging public health threats. Let's talk about that in a little bit more detail. Um, if you are using surface disinfectants in your practice, list Q. There are no disinfectants that are currently registered for use against monkeypox, but this list is disinfectants for emerging viral pathogens. Okay. And currently you're probably using list N. List N is not sporicidal. Now, this virus, we don't have to be concerned about spores, but if you want more bang for your buck, list Q is the way to go, or list K, but list Q is approved for monkeypox. So you'll it's sporicidal as well. So Clostridium difficile spores and other Clostridium spores, MRSA, multi-drug resistant organisms, all of it, and SARS-CoV-2 and monkeypox are included in list Q and there's the link for you there. So your current wipes are not list Q. The quaternary ammonium compounds are not sporicidal and they're not approved for list Q. They are list N for SARS-CoV-2, but they are not sporicidal. They will not kill spores, which you still should be concerned about. What about virus stability on environmental surfaces? Well, monkeypox virus, like all the other orthopox viruses, can remain stable in the environment for days to weeks under some circumstances, can survive in the scabs for months to years, are resistant to desiccation in hot and cold environments, so dry, arid temperatures like we have here in the desert, may remain stable for weeks, days to weeks, in water, soil, refrigerated food, and susceptible to inactivation under acidic conditions. Infection control, we need to be concerned about direct and indirect contamination through patient contact, inanimate objects, and other fomites, aerosol. So PPE, 
administrative controls, find out who's coming into your practice before they walk in the door, um, effective hand hygiene, surface decontamination, aerosol mitigation, and ongoing training is all critical. If you are in an area where you're concerned about monkeypox, and we know it can be spread through respiratory secretions, then the recommendation is an N95 mask. Disposable gown and gloves. It's prudent that when you are working chair side that you have your arms covered anyways with a disposable gown or a gown that is um, laundered. Of course, face shield or goggles and then NIOSH certified N95s. Surface decontamination, again, here's list Q. It recommends the use of bleach, hypochlorous acid. There are some quaternary ammonium reagents, but not what you're using. Now, hypochlorous acid is ideal because it does not bleach out your surfaces. It doesn't corrode when it's used at the right pH. Your uh, devices, it is not toxic and it's less expensive than what you're using right now. I'm going to be showing you something here very quickly here. Okay, aerosol generating procedures, of course, we need to be concerned about. So your hand pieces, your ultrasonic scalers, your three-way air water syringe. These dental procedures that we perform all day long are aerosol producing, and we have to be concerned about spatter, droplet, and droplet nuclei that persist in the dental practice and can contaminate our surfaces in the air and our contaminated surfaces if they're not properly disinfected can be re-aerosolized and contaminate again so manual disinfection high volume evacuation extra oral vacuum devices up-to-date hvac uvc technology and then surface disinfection critical to reducing aerosol and vice versa as i said UVC technology, um, not all created alike. This is a study that was conducted in 2007 that showed at 254 nanometers, germicidal radiation was able to greatly decrease the concentration of vaccinia virus, which again is the surrogate for smallpox, in an exposure chamber under controlled conditions. Electrostatic spraying technology using hypochlorous acid is ideal because you can turn over your operatory in about two to four minutes. The sprayer itself will electrostatically charge your particles in the hydrochloric acid so you get a wraparound effect. It's going to reach the areas that you can't get to with your little wipes and it's going to be sporicidal and to kill monkeypox and to kill MRSA and kill multi-drug resistant organisms and all the spores that we need to be concerned about, including Clostridium difficile. So it makes sense. How does it work? Again, it does charge the particles as it exits the nozzle and electrostatic spraying reaches up to three times more surfaces in the same amount of time it would take you to reach with your wipes. So it's a more effective way to disinfect your practice. You can use it in your reception area, your restrooms, which are a big concern as well. Strategy, strategies for prevention, vaccine, pre and post prophylaxis is now being used, behavioral change, and then of course improved testing. And by the look at the cases trending downward, there's been, um, some cause for success here. They were able to reach this population, vaccinate them, educate them, and test them. So we brought the cases way, way down. Now, we've got a, a comment from Ken here about particle size. It's important to know, I, if you're talking about the electrostatic sprayer, the one that I have here is actually one that I use at home and in my office. And it's important to know, hypochlorous acid is not all like, you can't go out and purchase some of these countertop 
producing little machines on Amazon for $185 and expect to get that effect because you won't. The pH is not right. That is not on list K or, or list Q and it can cause corrosion or fading of your products. So what you want to use is um, products out there that are around neutral pH and they are sporicidal at the right concentration, which is also important. So that not all hypochlorous acid products are considered EPA approved. If you're purchasing those devices off of Amazon, the little machines, those were originally made for food service, not for dental practices. We have some resources here for you in closing um, the infection control course that we offer will be the next one actually is this Saturday. It's a three hour course complimentary. So if you need infection control, I will be presenting it. I will be talking about surface disinfection in much more detail, as well as many other aspects of infection control. So please sign up for that. Also effective surface decontamination is another course that we offer. Superbugs, antimicrobial resistance and the dental practice. I present that and that's based on my own experience of surviving a life-threatening Clostridium difficile infection that followed a dental procedure last year. And um, antimicrobial resistance is a huge threat in our practices. So take that course if you haven't. Effective hand hygiene also. And then the course on hypochlorous acid we offer as well. On March 31st is our next antimicrobial technology symposium. It is live. You can earn up to seven CE credits and um, you are welcome to take a look at the agenda by tapping on the link there for you. And during that presentation, we have Dr. Tom Palmier from the American Dental Association who will be lecturing on antibiotics in clinical practice antibiotic stewardship and appropriate antibiotic use. He will talk specifically about the latest antibiotic prophylaxis um, as well as clinical applications. This is a tremendous opportunity to learn from an expert. So please be sure to register for that. You will have access to the recording if you're not able to attend. And that's for three and a half CEUs. We also have a recording here from Dr. Deborah Goff, who presented at our last symposium on the new dental antibiotic guidance. And she is with the World Health Organization. Um, she is a clinical professor at The Ohio State, as well as a clinical pharmacist and an expert in the antibiotic guidelines that we have currently. Her husband happens to be a prosthodontist. Additional monkeypox resources there for you and citations. And we're right on time here. Let's see if questions. So Michelle, it's a certified medical device and it produces hypochlorous acid. The problem here is that unit does not produce hypochlorous acid at a concentration that will kill spores, nor is it an EPA approved um, device for that application but it will kill other things. So just keep in mind though, the concentration and the pH are important. So when the EPA list K, when you look at that, there's a registration number and the um, it's EPA approved. I understand that, but it's not EPA approved for list Q. So when you see it and it says medical grade, it does not mean that it is necessarily sporicidal. If you call them and you ask them the tough question, you're going to find out probably differently. And Michelle, reach out to me and let me know, but I've had others that have had that device. So, but it's not to say that it's not doing its job. It's just that spores are extremely difficult next to impossible to kill. So that device probably produces a concentration of 200 to 400 parts per million. 
the required concentration to be sporicidal is 4,000. All right, so in many of these devices, it's actually four times what is recommended by the manufacturer. Any questions or comments before we close? All right. Well, again, if you need the infection control course, please be sure to sign up for that. Please be sure to sign up for the symposium on March the 31st. And for all of you that joined us a little late, be sure you have your hands on the handout and CE credit instructions. So you can do that by tapping on the banner at the top of the screen. Otherwise, we're going to have a real hard time getting CE credit tonight. We're going to be getting questions about how do I get CE credit here. Um, when we log out, you are going to be redirected to a screen to complete the quiz. You're also going to be emailed this quiz. So if you're not ready to take the quiz yet, not a problem. You can wait. It'll be sent to you here in about a minute or two minutes. Complete the quiz. You'll need 80% passing score. You will have two attempts. After the first attempt, check your email because you'll receive a full report that will show you every question you missed so that when you retake this quiz, it should be a slam dunk on the second run. If you have any questions, you're going to see a link in those CE credit instructions. Please don't text us because it's confidential information. We're going to want you to fill out a little form and we'll be right back at you to help you. Thanks so much for being here this evening. We have other live classes this week, so be sure to check the website. Take care and we'll talk to you soon.